Thanks, Gareth. I might just move this out of the way. Yeah, Gareth, thanks for the invitation to speak. Uh, it's lovely to be with you this morning. Great to meet some of you already. No doubt I'll get to meet more of you uh, afterwards. And it's lovely to have the opportunity to share this part of God's Word with you. Um, probably a story that you're familiar with. I understand you've been working through the book of Hebrews over the last weeks or months. And, uh, obviously the narrative in John's Gospel is quite different to what you've been looking in Hebrews. And Although I think there is a connection, I won't particularly point it out, but you might think about what the connection is here. Uh, so as we come to look at God's Word, will you pray with me again as we prepare ourselves to hear. Father, we thank you that you speak to us, uh, that you've spoken to us fully and finally and perfectly in the Lord Jesus, that your word points us to him and uh, reveals him to us, and we pray that you do that now, work in us and among us by your spirit, that we might see again the wonder of who Jesus is and all that we have in him. So we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I wonder how much you have had to or may have yet still to give up for God. What does it cost you to follow Jesus? Uh, a few years ago, I was preaching on this same passage uh, and I was visiting, visiting India. Uh, and it was an evening service and so we had a meal together with some members of the congregation before the meal, uh, and I was sitting across the table from a lady uh, who was telling me that that coming week uh, she was expecting that a fellow would fly to the city that she was in. She'd met him online. Uh, a relationship had begun, started to, to, to uh, mature, and he was coming to visit her for the first time, and she was expecting that he'd propose. But he wasn't a Christian. And her Christian friends at church and the pastor at her church were telling her that you know, this is not a relationship you should pursue. You need to say no if he asks you. But it was so hard for her. Um, she was in a culture where being married really did matter. And meeting a nice guy was, was her dream and now it had happened. But everyone at church was telling her no, Christians only marry Christians. And they weren't saying that just for cultural reasons, you know, they really were saying to her, if, you, uh, if you're committed to following Jesus, if you want to keep growing as a Christian, you need to be married to someone who is a spiritual match to you. And she was torn. She was a committed Christian. But she desperately wanted to get married. And so I was preaching on this passage and I opened with a similar question. What will it cost you? How much does God ask of you? And she came up to me after the sermon and said, that question was just for me, wasn't it? Well, it wasn't just for her, but for her that afternoon, the cost was very, very clear and concrete. So, so what is it for you? Uh, what has it cost you? Perhaps it cost you time and money. Uh, it might be that you've made tough decisions, that being a Christian has cost you family relationships or friendships or a job or a reputation. You know, Gareth asked me, you know, you can pray for Australia, reflecting, I think, for all of us um, in the Western world, just following Jesus in our culture is harder and in lots of ways more costly. You might look at your Christian friends and family and think, life would be easier if I was like them. So how much does it cost you and what more might God ask of you? Well, I, I ask you that question because what I want to look, with you, uh, look at with you this morning is the fact that whatever it costs, whatever you have to give up, God gives far more. Because the passage we're looking at shows the wonderful, incredible abundance of Jesus. 
So we're looking at John chapter 2, this first shocking sign of Jesus. He makes wine. He comes to a wedding, probably some family connection because his mother's there as well. The hosts run out of wine. Uh, Jesus' mother points out the problem. He seems to resist to begin with. But then he tells the servants to fill the jars with water and the water becomes wine, great wine. We're told the best wine. And Jesus has made hundreds of litres of this wine. Now, now for some Christians, uh, they're a bit nervous about this as Jesus' first sign in John's Gospel. They, they wonder why Jesus would do that. I guess sometimes we're a bit nervous about parties and pleasure and, and wine. We imagine that being spiritual is being dour and, and, and serious, but that's not Jesus. Celebrations and feasts and, uh, you know, are they part of God's good creation uh, that he delights in and he's made us to delight in it? And so Jesus' first sign is at a wedding helping with the celebration. And, and as he does that, he's meeting a real need. Uh, in Jesus' day, weddings were big family and community events, hundreds of people would come uh, and it would go for several days. And there was a terrible shame if you ran out of food or wine. In fact, there's some indication that you could be sued by your guests if you didn't produce a good enough feast. And, and Jesus' family is you know, probably a poor family or this, this family is probably a poor, poor family. Jesus doesn't come from wealthy circles. And you imagine that they've put everything into the wedding feast, but there's more people there than they were expecting. They thought they could water down the wine and it'd get through, but it won't. And so they're facing a problem. Uh, several years ago now, I was at a wedding and, and during the reception, uh, sitting around the table, one of the ladies on the table told the story about her wedding, that at the reception all of the guests got food poisoning. Uh, apart from her and her new husband because they were too busy talking to people to eat the contaminated food. Uh, so she managed to tell this story in a way that was absolutely hilarious, but I'm sure at the time it was anything but hilarious. But you know, everyone would have remembered that wedding. And not because of the dress or the service or the speeches. You know, they all just would have said, that was the wedding we got food poisoning. And the wedding at Cana is facing a crisis a bit like that. This is, that's the wedding they ran out of wine. That's the shame that they'll have. So this is not a life and death need, but it is a real problem. And what we notice is Jesus meets it abundantly. He provides more than enough of the very, very best wine. And I think that more than enough abundance of the very, very best uh, really helps us to understand what is going on in this passage and why John has told us this story. Because often in John's Gospel, uh, what, what we read has two levels of meaning. You've got the story, and you read that and you see what happens, but then as you think about it, you realize, oh, there's, there's more going on here, there's more symbolism happening. And, you know, that happens in modern books as well. Uh, there's a modern Australian book by Kate Grenville called The Idea of Perfection, which tells the story about two people who come to a country town. Uh, the man is an engineer who's arrived to demolish this rickety old bridge in the middle of the town, and the woman has come to help the locals campaign to keep the bridge. Uh, and the symbolism is pretty obvious. This is a you know, bridge that's worn out over time, uh, almost ruined by the things that have happened to them. And as you read the story, you find out both the man and the woman are similar. They're kind of beaten and battered by their lives. And then the big question in the book is, are they going to connect? Or will their connection be destroyed the way the bridge is meant to be demolished? And so the bridge becomes symbolic of them and their relationship with each other. And John's Gospel is often like that. At one level, there's a story. But then as you think about it, you realise, oh, okay, there's, this is telling me more than just the story. So I want to show you in John 2 a few 
clues that help us to see what the miracle is about and the way in which it points to Jesus. So five, five clues. The first one is Jesus' resistance. Uh, he, he almost seems to be rude to his mother. He says, you know, what is, why are you trying to involve me? What's this, what's this got to do with us? Uh, you, we might wonder, why does Jesus resist? Well, he says to Mary, because my time has not yet come. What's he talking about? His time has not yet come. Well, either Jesus himself or John writing the gospel says three more times through the gospel, my time has not yet come, his time has not, had not yet come, until we get to chapter 12, and in chapter 12, Jesus says, my time or my hour has come. And he says that a couple of times. And, and that, of course, introduces the last week of his life, his, his betrayal and his death and his resurrection. He's come with a task from the Father to bring new life, to reveal God's glory, to save, to call those who are his and he'll do that at the right time and if he does now what Mary wants him to do he'll somehow be almost getting ahead of himself, he'll be doing something now that's really about what he's come to do through the whole of his life and so what Jesus does here we have to understand as being a sign about the whole of his life and his whole mission. It anticipates what is to come. Secondly, another clue is just the setting. It happens at a wedding with a feast and and wine. And in the Old Testament, our weddings were always a sign of God's blessing. You know that life is good when people have got time to marry and to celebrate that, when they've got time to enjoy a party and and, and, and to make a feast. Uh, I, I know in Australia, I'm, I'm sure here as well, during the um, you know, COVID years, uh, weddings were prohibited or they were limited to only a small number of guests. And you know, I think for lots of people and lots of families, that really added to the grief of those years, not being able to have a wedding. Um, my daughter was one of a rush of weddings that happened in early 2022. And that day would have been special anyway, but I think it felt extra special for us because uh, this was the first time that we'd really got together with friends and family uh, for a couple of years. And, and so when God talks about his future kingdom in which he'll save his people and they'll enjoy him in security, one of the things he says is that there'll be weddings and feasts. And so as we see the feast at Cana blessed by Jesus, we see a picture of that kingdom that God brings. God's bringing a new creation full of you know, a city of gold and rivers of life and trees with the leaves of healing and parties and the wedding feast of the Lamb. And, and so here Jesus gives us a little snapshot, a little anticipation of what he's come to bring. Uh, the third clue is about the, is those water jars. Uh, where did the water jars come from? Well, John tells us there were six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing. They were used for purification. If you read in the Old Testament, there's lots of instructions about how before each meal or before you ate, you needed to wash various vessels and cooking utensils and your hands. And by Jesus' time, that had got even more complicated, those sort of rules. And they were there to show the people of Israel that their whole life was impure, a bit like you were telling us earlier. Our hearts are impure. In fact, all of them are impure. And so every time they came to a meal, they needed this ceremonial washing. But Jesus knows that now that he's come, they're not going to need that any longer. He has come to make them truly clean. Uh, in a, a few chapters later, he will say to his disciples, you are clean because of the word I spoke to you. 
by his spirit, through his word, by his life and his death and his resurrection, he will make people truly clean. And so the ceremonial washing isn't needed any longer. And so there's this beautiful picture of fulfillment. He doesn't scrap those jars, but he turns the, cer- the water of purification into the wine of celebration. And, fourth clue, it's not just that there's wine. Jesus makes the very best wine. So the manager of the, of the, the wedding feast you know, says to the, the bridegroom, everyone brings out the choice wine first and the cheaper wine later. You start with the good and then you know, when, when people have had a little bit to drink, you, you bring out the cheaper stuff. But he says, but you have saved the very best Till now. And that is exactly what God does when Jesus comes. God brings his very best. Jesus is not just a step along the way. He's not just you know, one prophet in a long line of prophets. He is the fullness. He's the completeness. Uh, John's told us that with a kind of trumpet blast at the very beginning of Uh, Chapter 1, that that prologue to John's Gospel. So verse 17, the law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Verse 14, he is the word of God become flesh. The word became flesh and has made his dwelling among us and we have seen his glory. That's who has come and is now standing with them at the wedding, showing his first sign. And none of the guests at that wedding, having tasted the wine that Jesus has made, will go up to the steward and say, could I have a bit of that, the first stuff that we had? Could I have a bit of that early? I've got a few bottles of that left. They won't want to go back because they've tasted the best wine. And so the same, this is, I think, part of John's point here, God's very, very best has come. So all these clues in the passage point us back to Jesus. The sign shows us about Jesus' mission. It's the celebration of God's abundant kingdom. It's the fulfilment of the Old Testament signs with the reality. It's about Jesus bringing abundance and fullness now. If you have Jesus, you have the very best. You have the light of life. You have God himself and life from him and with him. That's the abundance that Jesus brings. He doesn't promise us now jars of wine. They're a sign. But he promises us something way better than that that because of him we go from being dead and cut off from God to knowing him and living with his life and his power and his spirit. With Jesus, what happens to you is more remarkable than what what will happen to Lazarus later on in chapter 11 when Jesus calls Lazarus out of the grave. Jesus gives to us fullness of life, completely nothing miserly, nothing held back, the full glorious life of God. Which, which makes a difference to life now. It does give us a direction and a confidence, even that the call to worship at the very beginning that Gareth was reminding us from Hebrews. We have a confidence to enter into the presence of God. We know that God's love holds us. We have communion with God. But that abundance now is only the beginning of a resurrection life that is never defeated by death. Jesus transforms death so that instead of it being a terrible end for his people, it becomes a gate to life forever. And so part of John's message is there's no point going back to the old wine, to the old patterns of Judaism when you've got Jesus. Now, 
most of us are probably not going to be tempted to go back to Old Testament law and Jewish ways. But when being a Christian is tough, we are sometimes tempted to go back to our old ways. Uh, at, our, at my own church a couple of weeks ago, a uh, fellow was leading music and he talked about the fact that this was the first time that he was up in front leading music since a, a terrible tra family tragedy a few months before. And he said something like this. He, he said, it's been a tough few months and I slipped back into, into old ways and past sins. He said, but, but it's clear to me only Jesus has the answers. He is the light and the life. And so perhaps you know that pattern of looking back and slipping back to the old ways that we find comfort in anger or lies or complaining. We throw ourselves into work or family, um, think we'll get value and satisfaction and status and contentment from that and, and not from Christ. But in Jesus, you have the very best. So John finishes the account uh, in verse 11 with what is the fifth clue. Jesus, uh, John says, what Jesus did here in the Canaan of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Jesus came to people with real need. He took their old ways and he cleansed them. He fulfilled their old ways and filled them with life in profusion, more they could imagine. That is Jesus' glory. And for the disciples, it was the first glimpse of knowing who Jesus was and why he'd come and what he would do. And the wine was a sign of the life that Jesus brings. And it says, God gives richly and freely, abundantly, more life than you could ever possibly grasp. I think Christians sometimes give the impression to, even to ourselves and to each other and to people around us, that being a Christian is dry, that it's just about doing our duty and keeping the rules and just a hard slog every day. And of course there are tough times and hard seasons. But we make it worse for ourselves when we forget all that God has given us in Jesus. So I started by asking you, what are you going to have to miss out on? What, what's the cost? And I hope you see the answer is nothing. Not that there is no cost, but what God gives is almost, all is always so much more. He doesn't ask you to miss out. He offers you life as abundant as the water turned into wine. Uh, a few years ago, my actually just a few years ago, this I think it was four years ago, five years ago, this, this week, uh, my family were at a, at a great wedding. Uh, two friends of ours, both of whom had had terrible experiences in their first marriages, and were bruised by that, and they were both bringing up uh, t two sons. But for both of them, there'd been a wonderful spiritual renewal in their lives, um, and God had brought them together, and they were at the point where they were committing their lives to each other. It was a, just a glorious story of God's grace to his wounded children. And the wedding was on one of those idyllic sort of days. It was in the uh, local, the grounds of the local art gallery, there was beautiful warm sunshine and green grass and good music and tables overflowing with food and, and there was even some wine um, and family and friends celebrating together and at the centre of it were this couple, uh, Tony and Alexander, Alexandra, uh, a couple whose, each of whose lives had been restored and redirected by Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that life always turns out like that and, and certainly didn't mean that their lives were just easy from then on. Uh, they had to learn to live as a blended family. But it was a great reminder of God's abundance. 
of his glorious grace. He turns our water into wine. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your wonderful, overwhelming generosity to us in Jesus. When we deserved nothing from you, you gave us everything. We thank you that the word has become flesh so that in him we might have a life and power and the blessing of your spirit and the comfort of your presence uh, and the sure certainty of life with you forever. Uh, Help us just to keep seeing that abundant grace of yours and from that to grow, to to take confidence uh, and to live with joy. And we pray it in his name. Amen.